Yes. All right. Nobody decided to show up today. Huh? Well, you just you might be surprised. It'll, a lot of times they drag in late. All right. Now then, this is test 14, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, first question on test 14. Automotive electronics. Uh, automotive electronic test 14. Technician A says slow sunroof operation. Can be, be caused by excessive resistance in a circuit or a motor. Is he right? Technician B says an ohmmeter can be used to test the current draw. Come on, you don't test current draw with an ohmmeter. Get real. All right. Number two, technician A says in a typical electronic cruise control system, the vent valve is a normally open valve. Technician B says the electronic cruise control system utilizes vent and supply solenoids. Yeah, he's sure. correct on that. That's a uh, that's a technician A. What it does is it's got one solenoid that vents and one that you know puts his vacuum and vent, not vent, just the vent supply. And it operates them both to modulate and put the cruise where it wants to be. See if it puts too much vacuum in there and the cruise goes to, and the throttle opens or it opens the throttle too much, it's got to vent some of that off to bring it back to where it's supposed to go. So it's going to use them both. It's going to have two if it's a vacuum cruise. Well, two A or C. Two is A. Technician A says a faulty server could be the cause of an inoperative. <laughs> that should be servo, not server. Could be the cause of an inoperative cruise control system. Technician B says the cause may be the dump valve and stuff up, stuck open, and who is correct about that? Let's go see. Now let me talk for a second about cruise control. This is kind of important. Now, this cruise control is one of the things that you don't modify. You don't modify the cruise control system on somebody's car. Don't modify it, leave it like factory wood. Because if you modify it, it crashes and burns, they're going to come back on you, and it's not anything. It might seem to be totally harmless. This is never going to be a problem, blah, blah, blah. But They've got a, law, a record breaking lawsuit against you if you've modified their cruise control and it don't work right and they crash and burn it over there. Um, on your cruise control system, and this is something I always have to remember to talk about when we, when we come to this kind of thing. The cruise control system, what does it need to know? This thing right here is going to be making the decisions about your cruise. So what does it need to know? Your vehicle speed. It needs to know vehicle speed. Yes, yes. And VSS may either come from another module or it may come directly from a speed sensor. Right. Okay, so what is it what else does it need to know? Fuel pressure. No, the fuel the cruise control doesn't have any need for fuel pressure. It needs to know how fast the car is going. What else? Engine vacuum. Uh, well this particular one we're just gonna say it's cruise. I mean we're gonna we're gonna go with electric cruise. Completely electronic? Yeah, completely electronic cruise. Now you got a ten wire connector there, guys, there's more to it than that. What else do you need coming into that cruise control module? Uh, ground. You need ground. Power. You need power. All right. Now what? What else? Uh, you need to know what your it needs. Position? It not not well. No, it needs to know. And on mo on the ones that it's got a built-in pot, and so I know where it is. RPM. Uh, it does well. That's not a bad answer either because on some of the cruise controls that you installed aftermarket, it actually has an RPM, a little uh, inductive pickup that goes on the spark plug wire. If the engine starts running away, you know, and the speed's not running away with it, then it will know that. If it's a manual transmission, it needs to know that you've mashed your clutch, doesn't it? Okay. It needs to drop the cruise if you mash your clutch. Okay, it also needs to know about your brakes. Has he, huh? It's like a switch. As he pressed your brake. Well, and this is how it knows about the brakes. Okay, your brakes have got, let's say that here's your brake light bulbs right here. I'm just going to put one bulb there. That's, that's, that's a fuse. I need a bulb. That's a bulb, and that's ground. All right, now then up here, you've got your stoplight switch, right? Mm -hmm. All right, and your stoplight switch, obviously there's a fuse up here, but your stoplight switch is actually going here. All right, now, so the cruise is reading right there. That is a ground. Makes sense. It's looking at a ground. It doesn't care about voltage. The cruise typically is just looking to see if you have got a ground coming through the stoplight. You blow both stoplight bulbs, you've lost your cruise. See what I'm saying? Yep. If you blow the fuse going to your stoplights, your cruise will still cancel because most of them have a redundant circuit of some kind. Like on the Fords, they got a little brake pressure switch. And the brake pressure switch in, the, in here, you've got something vaguely similar to an air conditioner compressor clutch, but it's got teeth on it. 
And whenever your cruise is operating, that little electromagnet is pulling them, te pulling them teeth in so that it, that little drum's got control of the cable, right? Now, later cars have used the throttle, electronic throttle plate and circuits in the PCM. But we're talking cruise, this guy's got electronic cruise. Now, there is, in this little clutch that's in here, this little electromagnetic clutch, it's got two wires coming out of it. And one of them's grounded, and the other one gets power through a pressure switch that's normally closed, right? All right, so that's another power that's coming in. So when you mash the brake, not only are you tell, are you eliminating this ground reading that you're getting right here, you're actually looking at the, uh, you know, this right here. This will open up when you mash the brake and it drops that coil so that it doesn't have cruise anymore. So you got to have something redundant. you got to have redundant stuff on a cruise you, so that, you know, two things have to be true before the cruise will operate. Right. There's a third thing that has to be through. It won't operate under about 30 miles an hour. Most of them won't. They don't want it operating at low speed. All right. And the cool thing about it is on the ones that have PCM controlled cruise, like on the Jeep Cherokee I've got, it will tell you what canceled the cruise the last time it canceled. So if you're cruising and the cruise dropped out, it'll tell you that the brake switch canceled it or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Or, or it was canceled because of speed or, or whatever canceled it. All right. So look what we got right here. What's How am I going to. Most of them won't set overnight either. Yeah, you're probably right. But uh, if I've got, how am I going to fix it so that when I mash my clutch? Same way you do with the brake light switch. Well, sort of. You're going to break the same circuit, but you're going to have a normally closed switch hooked to your clutch. And that clutch, whenever you mash the clutch, it's going to open this the same way. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So both ways, if you break that circuit, uh, and, and remember the one I told you about that the cruise wouldn't work on? And the cruise wouldn't work on it. And what we did was, I said, let's look at everything we got. We don't know if we got power. We don't know if we got ground. We don't know if we got speed signal. And I said, let's look at the brake light. I always like to go and see. If I get my test light, a good, strong test light that's got a, you know, low impedance bulb in it, one of those kind that they tell you not to use at National Law Studio, Auto Diesel College. I hook that thing into the wire, back probe into that wire in the cruise module, and I see that it does not burn a light. I've found my problem. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The bulbs are good, and the light don't burn. What does that mean? Do if the bulbs are good, and the light don't burn, what does that mean? Faulty wire. Yeah, but Faulty what if I mash the brake? What if I mash the brake, and the and the lights come on, but the cruise still does, never sees the ground right here? Well, you still got faulty wires, or if you got a manual transmission, you got a bad clutch switch. A lot of them will have a clutch switch jumper. See, if they got a, and if that clutch switch jumper, if some yo-yo got in there and said, hey, I think I'll do something with this, yank, rolls the jumper out, now you got no cruise anymore. The one that I was talking about before had little LED lights in the back for, that they had put in there that was supposed yeah. to make the car look tricked out. Mm -hmm. And uh, that problem with that one was they weren't providing enough of a ground of that speed control that they had crewed. The crews went away after they replaced those lights. And th the only thing that we could tell them was put the other lights back in there or, do, or forget about having crews. Now, whoever designed those lights eventually may have done something to, you know, provide more of a ground back there. But the fact of the matter is, that's the stuff that you got to have. Oh, one more thing. What else did we leave out? We left out something. The cruise has to know what you want to do, doesn't it? You have to have an on button. You got to have an off button. You got to have set, accelerate, coast, this kind of thing. Okay, so that's done different ways on different cars. On these Chryslers. You've got power coming into a bank of switches, and each time you push a button, a different switch gets, I mean, a different wire gets hot. See what I mean? But on the Ford, what you got on the Ford is you've got stepped resistor in there. So off is dead short in the ground. It's one wire. You've got a blue wire with a black stripe coming from the cruise control of those switches on the steering wheel. And when you push on, 12 volts travels down that wire. When you push off, that wire's going to ground. Right. If nothing is going on, you got eight volts on that wire. Remember that. Go to the blue wire with the black strap if it ain't working. Do you have eight volts coming out of your cruise control module? If it's a standalone module or if it's an electronic one, I don't care. If I got eight volts there, then I know that the module is probably smart enough to know what it needs to do. With your meter still hooked up to that eight volt wire, you're going to go through all your switch positions. When you hit off, that voltage ought to go nowhere, go to zero. When it, you hit uh, on, it ought to go to 12 volts. When you hit your set, accelerate, and coast, it ought to step up to different voltages, you know, this way and that. Yeah. So that's how you can tell. Let me ask you this. All right, pay attention. 
if I've got that my meter hooked into that wire and I got eight volts there and I hit my set button and that voltage doesn't change, what's the most likely cause of my problem? And the voltage doesn't change? Yeah. Well let's say on my off and on it does, but I hit my set button and it doesn't change. Now no hit off, it goes to zero, hit twelve, on it goes to twelve volts. Uh, which that, that uh, voltage is coming through the starter, I mean through the horn relay, up through the clock spring and all that kind of stuff. But I hit my set button and I don't see any change in voltage. I got bad switches, man. I know, so it has to be bad switches. I mean, yeah, it's the only thing. I mean, well, if it, if it doesn't change, you're not cruising, it doesn't work, does it? Exactly. That's why you're looking at the car, because the customer said my cruise don't work. Okay. See what I, was, I, was about to say, I thought you. I thought you were saying, all right, the cruise works, and this. No. Okay. No, 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 no. It doesn't work. I'm not going. I'm not going to confuse you like that. If you hit, uh, if you hit coast and it changes, but set and it don't, that's hands down, man. That's switch. Yeah. You can pop a switch on there. Pay attention to your clock spring and how all that's working. And to, to put cruise on my pickup truck, I 07 uh, Ford pickup. All I had to do was buy a fifty-two dollar set of switches, because everything was on that truck already. It's got electronic throttle. I put those switches on the steering wheel, it was real easy. I placed those little plugs off that were where the switches went, put the switches in. The place to plug the wires in was right there on the box. I was going to say, was the wires there? They were there. Everything was there. <laughs> Plugged it in. Jimmy plugged the laptop in. It goes in there, and there's one place where it says, do you have cruise? He said, yes. Bam, I had cruise. How much more was it for the cruise? Oh, if you bought the cruise on the truck, it's, it's pretty darn high, probably several hundred dollars. Yeah. But it cost me 52 bucks. The cruise is there, though. Even the light in the cluster, the little green light that looks like a speedometer come on, it was there. I mean, but, and if you look in the Ford Accessories catalog and you're looking for a add-on cruise control, they don't even offer one. Because a knowledgeable te technician will know that all you got to do is put the switches in there, plug them in, tell them to go to the uh, IV, uh, you know, the laptop that Ford uses. It used to be the WDS, I think it's IVS now, but anyway, no, what is it called? IDS. You plug that thing in and there's a part of the menu you go to where it says, do you have a cruise? If you say yes, it wakes up the part of the PCM that has cruise, <laughs> you know, and that's what I did. So I got cruise for $52 on my truck, and it works just like factory. Everything's wired up there, you know. I mean, I didn't modify anything. It also added a lot of value to the truck, see? Yeah. See what I'm saying? If these people that bought the order these trucks knew had had good sense, they would have ordered a truck without cruise, added the cruise to it like I was just talking about it, and then marked the truck up an extra, you know, however much it was for cruise. You know, that's yeah. a good sales employee yeah. there. But they don't ever think like we do. All right, number four. Let's see. Uh, technician A says when diagnosing the heated windshield system, override the temperature sensor. Technician B says a low alternator output has no effect on heated windshield system. Ha, ha, ha. Heated windshield. Have you ever seen these windshields that when you're driving down the road, they look like they're made out of brass? I mean, when you're meeting them, you ever seen the, the, it, looks, it looks gold? That's a heated windshield, typically. Number four. Um, and that's a, and they, those the heated windshield on the cars I know about came out in Crown Victorias and Tauruses years ago, but well, that's not even such a big deal anymore. Uh, that's that's going to be a number uh, five. Technician A says the film used in the heated windshield systems may reduce the effective range of radar detectors. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, never thought about that. Technician B says a crack or a chip in the windshield will cause a close in the circuit. Uh, who's right about that? Uh, a A is right about that. Yeah. Uh, so, any theft system diagnosis. Incidentally, you know how uh, rain sensing wipers work? You know, the, the iridescence of the windshield is measured around the edge of the windshield. It's actually got this little thing that measures the light coming through the windshield. And whenever it starts getting raindrops on it, the way that the, wind, the light travels through that glass, it changes. Oh, okay. See, and, and, it, and it actually sends a signal to make that windshield wipers come on. I worked on an Explorer one time that had an aftermarket sunroof. And this aftermarket sunroof, the way that it was originally set up to work, if the temperature inside that vehicle got hotter than 140 degrees, the sunroof would open. What? Mm -hmm. Automatically. However, What's if... Sound? Huh? What's that sound? Uh, I love that because you... Huh? If, I don't know what it is, but if a raindrop was to fall, they got, there's a little bitty sensor down at the corner of the windshield that they had stuck on there. It looked like little pilot's wings or something, but they had little copper strips on it, and it had a couple of wires going to it. If a raindrop fell, I mean, happened to hit that that little sensor there, and if it's raining, it's going to be raining everywhere. You right. know what I mean? As soon as it touched that sensor, it would close the sunroof. It was a smart little system, really. I don't know who put it on there. But, I mean, personally, I wouldn't want to have the job of putting sunroofs on cars because you got to cut a hole in the roof and all that kind of hogwash. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a lot of trouble. 
you know, but that particular one had a bad motor on it. My, the motor and the module were both bad. I'd replace the motor and the module. And I was just amazed at that thing. Now, you know how you're supposed to check it? Uh, now, the heat part of it, the hot part of it, you didn't because it had a heat sensor in that module. I didn't check that. It really no good way to check it is it park it out in the sun. But when you open the sunroof, like if, even if you left the sunroof open, and you come around here and you lick your finger or put some water on it and just touch that little sensor with your wet finger, it would close the sunroof. And so, like, if, you, if you're sitting there and it's open, you're like, uh, all right. Just no, it's on the front of the windshield outside. Oh, boo. Yeah. That'd be cool if you to be like... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you wanted to you do this, no you, know, you could do this. And it'll make it good. Yeah. All right, so... All right, number six. Any theft system diagnosis is being discussed. Technician A says you must use a scan tool to diagnose an anti-theft system. Some anti-theft systems will not talk to a scan tool. Please, excuse me. Technician B says some systems can be diagnosed without a scan tool. Uh, who is correct? I tell you, you can, you can diagnose most of them without a scan tool, but if you can talk to it with a scan tool, plug your dog on scan tool in. That's another thing that I was going to uh, like on some of the vehicles I worked on. The last time the theft alarm system lit off, the scan tool will store which yeah. switch lit it off. Yeah. I mean, I actually set something up that way. You know, to do it on that one car I was talking about last week that you missed, but you will see in the video. Uh, but so, like on some of the Jeeps and everything, they say, someday the thing light off. So I plug my scan tool in, I look at it, and it would say, uh, the hatch lit it off. So you go back there and you find out the hatch switch is sort of iffy. You know, it works and it don't, this kind of stuff. Or maybe it's out of adjustment or something like that. Um, okay, so that's the deal on that. So, uh, But anytime you can use any theft, there was a, a Ford... Uh, expedition that came in there that had been at another dealership and it was Ford was just about to buy that car back because every now and then the uh, the horn would start honking and lights would flash and stuff this is while you're driving down the road right you know honk 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 flash 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 and all that and it just happened in the rain the only time it would happen was it was raining and so, so they took those things to car washes and everything else trying to get it to do it the mechanics did because it's driving the customers crazy you know this is the kind of thing where the mechanic work 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 or burns up half his day trying to figure it out he can't get it to do it customer gets it back before they get around the corner there's nothing on him I mean it's just the way it works you know the customer ain't doing it wrong but I mean it's, it's the law of averages and the Murphy's law it dictates that whatever you busted your ear in for four solid hours not making any money trying to find the customer can get it to do it before he gets to his favorite stoplight yeah. you know that's just the way that is you know so they says uh, the other Ford dealership down at such and such a place in Florida has completely given up on this. The field service engineer has gone down there. He's actually had him to replace all the perimeter anti-theft sensors all the way around it because he thought something was going on with one of them. And they, I think they'd replace the wire harnesses and other stuff trying to make it happen related to the perimeter anti-theft or whatever. So they got it up there and I got to investigate and expeditions didn't even have perimeter anti-theft. They never came out with it. They had those switches for other things, but they didn't use perimeter anti-theft. And so I opened the hood and I just was doing a little visual inspection. When you got an intermittent problem, you don't jack around and jerk on stuff. You look. You look and see what you see, right? I look down there and I see this blue wire and the wire that comes from the horn switch to the... And I did have a remote anti-theft personality module for the keyless entry. And it was tied into the lights and it was tied into the horn, right? You know, because you can always hit panic and all that stuff. And it would blink the light. So I look down there and I see this... Uh, little uh, blue wire and I see that it's sort of looped over against this black bracket and I says that wire is blue the wire that triggers a horn relay is blue and that may be what the problem is right there I mean I'm just I can just happen to see it now this is really unusual sometimes it's hidden where you can't see it but when I looked down there and saw it I says okay let's see what we can do right here you know you take a screwdriver and you push it a little bit tighter against that and it, and it blows the horn ah well when I poured it over I saw copper so it had been scratching against that bracket and when there was moisture there it was easier for it to make a connection. <laughs> See what I'm saying? That was the whole deal on that. So I put, all I had to do to fix that and prevent Ford from buying that expedition back was pull that wire back and wrap some tape around it good and tie it back with a tie wrap so it never touch again. You know what I mean? And so, but now they have these dealerships, I mean these, these manufacturers, they send people down there and the Ford people will say, your fix it right the first time scores are low. And that means people all over the dealership, whenever they send surveys out after the cars are fixed, uh, they say, was your car fixed right the first time or did you have to go back to get the same problem fixed more than once? 
And see, the, the people, the only people that ever fill those stupid things out are the people that had a bad experience. The people that you did, that they went there, got it fixed, and they went on about their business. When they get the survey, they may have had a good service experience, but they throw it in the trash. <laughs> they, don't, they don't send it back. But the people that are hacked off because they had to go back, they're going to send it in every time with bad numbers on it. So it skews the results, you see. Well, anyway, this guy named Bob was down at uh, there. He was in there at the service manager's office. And he says, and, and when I walked in there, to, when I walked in there to tell that guy about how I had fixed his expedition and Ford didn't have to buy it back, he started in on me about the shops fix it right the first time scores. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, you know, don't talk to me about this, you know, somebody else, another Ford dealership, we fixed this one right the first time and Ford was about to have to buy it back, I'm not even getting any credit for that. Okay, let's move. Okay, number seven. Let's see. Six. Six, excuse me. Technician A says you must use a scan tool. Okay, number six is basically going to be uh, B. That's a B. Te any theft system diagnosis is being discussed. Uh, technician A says you must use a... Hmm, excuse me. Why am I doing that? Any theft system of vehicle periodically goes off by itself. Technician A says the problem could be caused by a faulty door switch. Well, he's right about that. Technician B says worn contacts inside the starter interrupt relay could cause it. No... That's going to be in a, a remote keyless entry system is inoperative. Which of the following is the most common cause of the problem? Number eight. Weak battery. A weak transmitter battery. How can you tell if the transmitter battery is weak? That's a good idea to have a battery tester in your box, isn't it? Yeah. You can get one of those from Tech America. All right. An inoperative electronic cruise system is being discussed. Technician A says a close, a stuck closed brake switch could be causing a problem. Technician B says the problem could be caused by an open cruise engagement switch. Well, an open cruise engagement switch is darn sure going to cause a problem. Horn relays are sometimes included in the horn circuit for which of the following reason? Hmm, why is that? A, to allow the use of two horns? That's not right. No. B, to decrease, decrease the amount of current needed to activate the horn. How do you like that one? C. Well, actually it's C, to increase the, to decrease the amount of current that flows through the horn switch. Which actually, A, I mean, B and C would be right about that, I think, but I guess if you really wanted to pick, to pick the best answer, C would be the best answer. And not all vehicles have horn relays. I mean, most of them do nowadays, but there was a time when some of them the, the horn was blown by the switch. What do you do if the horn don't work? The horn don't work, you got to check it. What are you going to do first? Check the horn. Check power. Huh? Check power. That's a good answer, and that is too. I'm going to go right to the horn. If there's a relay, I'm just going to mash the button and see if I hear a click. All right. Then I'm going to go down to the horn, and I'm going to hook up my light between the horn and its ground. Some of them, one wire horns, you can hook it between the bracket that mounts the horn and the wire that goes to the horn. Have somebody blow the horn, see if a light comes on. If it does, you got a bad horn. That's usually what's wrong. Yep. Usually. Uh, if the light doesn't come on, you got to find out why. If it's got a two-wire connector going to the horn, one of those wires is ground and the other one's hot. Usually it'd be a blue one and a black one or something like that. Now you better be really careful when you're checking those. You know, put your little small wire or something in there that makes a contact with those without spreading the connector and check it with a little light. You can make a little light bulb. The little bitty light bulb where you can hook up between those two and hey, mash the button, see if it comes on, all that. So, um, I used to have this Ford Taurus, and I would like to. I listen to these radio sermons, and what I do is I would record them on a little cassette recorder I had, and so uh, I would leave my car switched on accessory with a recorder going, and I'd get out and going into work, you know, because this guy would start preaching about the time I was supposed to be going to work, and so uh, whenever the uh, cassette hit the end of his tape, it would click off and. You know, I'd have something to listen to when I went on my trip to Georgia because I'd recorded that stuff all week long. You know, that was a, you know, one of the trips. So what happened was uh, people kept going by there and they'd see that my accessory was on, the radio was playing. They'd switch the car off and bring me my key. I get so irritated with that. So you got to solve this problem. I had keyless entry on the car, and when you mash the button two times, it chirps the horn, right? Okay, so i got to switch. This is, this is how my car operated after I wired it up. And see if you can figure out how I did this. I got a switch so that when I turned off the car, and pull the key out, put it in my pocket, I could push a little tiny button under there that I made, and the radio would wake up. Okay? And then it would play 
as long as it needed to for me to record what I was trying to record, and nobody could turn it off except for me, right? I could have the doors locked on the car, the radio would be playing. All right, about 45 minutes later, if I was walking out in the service lot to get a car, and I was within, you know, keyless entry or boat, I'd go chirp, chirp, and when I chirp my horn, the radio would drop out. So how did I do that? Bypassed it. Come on. It worked perfectly normal. It worked perfectly normal every other time. All right. Now, this is important because we're in electrical, as you know, with this uh, slightly more advanced electrical class. How do you do this? Watch. This is what you're learning. This is a learning thing, guys. Okay, what have I got right here on my horn? This is my horn, and it's grounded, right? Okay. Coming in here, I got a horn relay. Right? All right. The horn relay has got B plus here, and then coming down here, it's going to the horn. So the horn, this actually is going to be grounded, or actually this is going to be, this is going to be powered, and then this is going to come from the horn switch. Also for my keyless entry. Right, so I'm going to put another relay in here. All right. Now tell me what I got to do. I'm going to put a relay in here. I'm going to make this work. You better be able to do this kind of stuff because you have to be smarter than the average bear to fix cars. Hey, there, right, Wes? Yeah, that's right. Now, when you're in school, you need to listen. Okay, so I took a relay right here. I've got a relay right here like this, right? All right. Now, that relay is actually going to feed my radio, which this is actually going to the radio to power it up. The radio is always grounded. It just needs a little power to wake up, right? Yeah. All right. So my little switch right here is actually a grounding switch. This is a little switch I put in. And it's a grounding switch. But look what happens here. Watch. This is important. Okay. This right here, when I ground that, excuse me, I, I, wrote, I drew that wrong. It's not a grounding switch. It's a B plus switch. It's been years since I've done this. Anyway, that right there was fixed up so that whenever, and this ever be plus too, so whenever I would do it and I'd fire it up, I would actually wire this so that this wire that got hot was also hooked to there. So this is a momentary switch, basically. And that momentary switch, when I clicked it, what happened? This relay would close, and it would be feeding itself with power. Right? Got it? However, the ground wasn't directly to ground. I had it wired here. So the only place that that relay coil could get any ground was through the horn. So when you beat so the what happens when I what happens when I chirp my horn? When I yeah. chirp my horn, the horn honks. This voltage goes away. The relay drops out. Now there was one thing I had to add to this. After I used it a little bit, I found it was a problem. I did not want the current that was provided provided to the radio from this relay to feed anything else. I didn't want everybody using power windows with these little connections I made all that stuff. So I had to put a diode in there so that the only place, the only thing that was powered up was the doggone radio. radio and nothing else would, could be powered up by that. So, I, you know, power could go through the diode, it couldn't go back. So the diode actually had to be wired in right here. See that? And anyway, that was my, my son. That particular car I sold to my son back in 2003, I think, or 2002. And that system was still on that car and working perfectly whenever he uh, sold the car. But the way I went, wired it up, if you wanted to take it off, you could unlatch that relay as a Ford relay. You could take it loose real easy, and I had wired it up between the radio. We use the radio connectors. If you unplug the radio connectors and plug the wires back into the radio, it's like that system was never there. See what I'm saying? Because that's the way I wire up everything. If I wire up something, I want to wire it up so when you unplug it, it's like you never knew it was there. So I try to get a little breakout connectors to do all this kind of stuff. You know, everybody does everything. Every picture is a job of the person that did it. Every job is a picture of the person that did it. Right? And if you do a crappy job, that means that that day you were a crappy person. Okay, you got it? Okay. Bluntly said? Huh? I said bluntly said. Yep. Uh, in an operative electronic cruise system is being discussed. Technician A says a stuck closed brake switch could be causing a problem. Technician B says the problem could be caused by open crew. That had already been there. Horn relays are sometimes included in the horn circuit to do what? To uh, let's see, right? Yep. 
Blower motors rotating very slowly. Being tested. All right. You got that? Okay. The voltmeter placed across the power and ground terminals of the motor indicates six volts when the blower switch is placed in the high speed position. All of the following statements about the cause of this problem are true except and this is the schematic. This is a little schematic right here. See the schematic? There's the schematic. You can see that. All right. So uh, A, the blower relay may be faulty. B, there may be excessive ground circuit resistance. C, uh, there may be excessive resistance in the power feed circuit in the motor. Or D, the blower motor may be faulty. So All of the above. That's going to be... <laughs> well, I don't really like that. What, I mean, the way that they've got this question answered. Okay, if it's operating very slowly, uh, if, the, if the terminals of the blower motor indicate six volts when the blower switch is placed in high position, how is the blower motor going to be what's wrong? That's what the answer key says, but that ain't right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I would say that. Let's see. Let's see how the things wired up here. Do you see a relay in this like on this circuit? Uh, I don't. All right. What about your ground circuit? You have some ground. Your voltage drop in the ground. I would be checking voltage drop. What I want to do. Uh, now I will tell you this. I don't like the way this is drawn. But you know why? Because most of the fan motor systems I'm familiar with. The power is delivered directly to the motor, and the resistor block has got ground flowing through it. But on this one here, I'm going to say it's a ground circuit. Now, there could be excessive resistance in the power feed circuit to the motor and the blower relay, but it ain't got a blower relay showing on here. Do you see a blower relay anywhere? I did not even see one. So, yeah, it's, it was a, it's a poorly worded question with poor answers and everything else. Of course not. I'm going to say that, uh, yeah, this is bad. But I mean, if they want to say the blower motor may be faulty, technician A says on an electromagnetic field wiper motor, the strength of the total magnetic field will uh, determine motor speed. Technician B says on an electromagnetic field wiper motor, the two field coils are wound in opposite directions, so their magnetic fields will oppose each other. Uh, that's actually going to be C. Whenever you see this little symbol right here, and I want you guys to be aware of this, be, re be really aware of this, I'm seeing an M, right? And I'm seeing this. What am I looking at? A motor. I am, but why do they use that symbol for a motor? Because you've got two lines. You do, but these, on this right here, see this little uh, armature mm -hmm. right here? You see the little commutator circuits? There's brushes. If you look at that thing endwise, it's round. And there's a brush coming directly on each side of it. And that makes that motor spin. This part right here represents that little round commutator. And these parts right here represent the brushes that are riding on it. Now, what you're going to see in some schematics, and I'm going here for a reason, and I'm just trying to impress you with my knowledge, you're going to see one that's got another winding over here. And one of those is going to be low speed, one's going to be high speed. Now, why do they draw that that way? It's got a third brush. And that third brush is at a different angle. And when wow. you power up that brush instead of this one, the motor runs at a different speed. Got it? Yep. Everybody got that. You, won't, you probably won't hear that anywhere else, but that's what that's the way it is. See the brush? Everybody. You got a brush there, a brush here, and you got another brush over here. All right? That's how that works right there. Okay, number 13. Let's see. Never mind. We're, well, excuse me. Let me flip the page so I can go to number 13. Technician A says the motor has a faulty ground connection when a two speed windshield wiper will operate only in the high position. Technician B says, the cause may be a worn low speed brush. Ah, what was this? What's this? A low speed brush, high speed brush. See that? Got that? Um, when a two speed windshield wiper will operate only in a high position. B. Or at number 13. That's going to be B. And, uh, you know, there's a little, there's the schematic that they draw for that one right there. See that one right there? There's the schematic. All right. Technician A says instrument, intermittent wiper systems use a solid state module that may be incorporated into the body computer. And incidentally, incidentally, this is what I was talking about. You see that low speed brush right there? See that? See how that little motor's got the, these are brushes. And there's your low speed brush in the wiper motor right there. And that's exactly what I was drawing right here up on the board. Right? Pretty, pretty good little deal there. Technician A says intermittent wiper system uses a solid state module that may be incorporated into the body computer. Uh, technician B says the capacitor operates the wiper motor directly until it's fully discharged. Sure. 
and there's number 14. There is a uh, movie that was made about this guy that created intermittent wipers. And so, yeah, when, when intermittent wipers I'm talking about is when you turn it on and it only wipes ever so often. So he created a circuit that would make that work. There's actually a movie that recently came out about it. I think it's called, I uh, can't remember that, something genius or whatever. But the long and the short of that was, and I didn't even see the movie, but I kind of was hearing about it on the news and all the stuff that's going on. For years, that guy in court, you know, he was he he sold this to Ford and GM and Chrysler and all these people. And the court awarded, and so he, he he said they didn't pay him enough for it because they were putting it on every car and everybody wanted it, right? And it, he said they didn't pay him enough. And so the court ruled that they had to pay him 22 cents per car. That's not bad. If you get a million cars you're selling, <laughs> that's pretty good big cash. So every car that they sold with that on it, they had to pay him 22 cents. So every five, he's getting a dollar. Yeah, exactly. A a and if they're selling 5,000 cars, he's getting what? $5,000, right? Or $500. What was it? Wait. So <laughs> every five cars, he's getting about a dollar. Yeah, so he's selling 1,000 cars, he's getting 500 right? More or less. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah, I think after he all those two cents. 222. Huh? 222. Twenty-two thousand dollars when he right. sold a million cars. Yeah, yeah. And, they, and they was a lot more than. And Ford had to pay him twenty-two cents. Chrysler had to pay. Him 20, I mean, they all had to pay the guy. And that was, you know, he, but he actually had something that was good that nobody had thought of before. And, um, I've actually installed uh, F, aftermarket intermittent wiper before. They make they make kits for that. I tell you something else I've installed that most people have never even thought about is aftermarket rear window defrost. You ought to try that. You know, that's fun. All right. Uh, you know, we were talking about those, the heater in your windshields and stuff mm -hmm. earlier. Well, um, my, my back windshield, mine's got a little line through it with little heater coals, mm -hmm. I think. I don't know. Only about like a quarter of it works. Yeah, you know what the reason is for that? Usually it's because people have thrown stuff on the back and it scratched down across the windshield and it broke those little plans. Now you can actually determine where those brakes are and they make some special uh, stuff that looks like gold fingernail polish that you can paint on there and put those back together. I mean I used to, have to do that at the dealership. People throw stuff on the package tray. The package tray is the back dash, you know. Yeah. People throw stuff back there, boxes and stuff like that or whatever it may be, and it will go it will go scratching down the windshield and it'll break several of those little grids. And so that's, but you can, it's fixable. And I'll tell you something else I used to have to do, and they was, I was the only one at the dealership that they ever asked to do it because nobody else could make it work. That little bus bar that's, you know, connected to the windshield over there on that copper yeah. place, it'll come loose and be swinging. And I used to have to put them suckers back on there. Um, I'm, I've been afraid to take it up. Yeah. Well, I mean, it actually, when I'm saying, there's a wire that plugs into a little, you know, bus bar, and that thing would break loose from the glass and it'd be swinging. Yeah. Well, the glass is like a thousand dollars, you know, but they wanted their rear window defrost working, and so they throw me a ticket on that thing. And what I did was, I, I would take the little, I would find a little place where that copper, you know, next to the place where it had pulled off. Then I would take this little, uh, this little bus, and I would sand it, make it really shiny and pretty. And then I would have it on the bench, and I'd put a, heat it up really good and hot, and bubble a piece of uh, some solder onto it, so it was stuck to it real good. And then I would very, very gently and very carefully with a real small soldering iron go to the place on the car where I'd sand it just a little bit, where that little copper place where it used to attach was, and I would put a bubble of solder there, right? And then I would hold it with a pair of pliers up against the two bubbles of solder that I'd put were touching, and then I would hold my soldering iron against there, and when that solder, as soon as it got hot and it flowed, I would move my soldering iron but keep my you know, I'd actually usually have a screwdriver holding it. I'd hold it with a screwdriver while I moved my soldering iron. When it cooled off, that thing was on there. And I fixed a bunch of them things like that, you know. And I had one guy that was telling me, Ford's going to buy me a new windshield for that because he was trying to get it fixed in another dealership and they couldn't fix it. And I said, they're not going to buy you a windshield for that. They're just not going to do it. I mean, because there's a procedure for fixing that. They're not going to spend 800 or or $1,000 worth of warranty money putting a windshield yeah. in there when, there's, when it can be fixed, you know. And it's really not 
you know, good for them to expect that either. But anyway, uh, if they do, the warranty will get charged back. You know, like if you, if a dealership did that and charged it to Ford, and Ford comes and wa wa audits those tickets, they're going to say, no, we're going to charge this back to the dealership. They're not going to shut thousand dollars out like that. Okay. Slower than normal wiper operation is being discussed. Technician A says this may be caused by excessive electrical resistance. Technician B says this may be caused by something Wes did. Oh, I'm sorry. In the mechanical language, who is correct? 15. C. Both A and B. Mechanical linkage can bind up and cause them to go slow. Wipers are really interesting creatures. And some of them have got a bunch of relays that operate them, some of them don't. But how many of you, how, do you, how does the wiper system, and you guys need to know this, how does it know when to park? I mean, where park is? Like when you turn off the wipers, it's going to go until it stops. How does it do that? How do you do that? Imagine yourself having to design something like that. That's the way I always figured out how they do stuff. I'd say, if I had to fix that, what would I do, you know? Some of them don't. Well, they're supposed to, though. If they're right, yeah. they're actually supposed to. And on some of the Crown Vickies, you may have even seen Crown Victorias, like early 90 models, they have the wipers up all the time. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're just, they won't park. Because the, the park, uh, you know, mechanism inside the motor screwed up. You gotta put a, a wiper motor on it whenever that happens. If you wanna fix it, it's a couple of hundred dollars. Uh, and there's actually a different connector you're supposed to put on there that's a different looking one and all that kind of stuff. But uh, how would you do that? I'm going to have it so that there's power being fed all the time to the wiper motor, right? And when the key's on, right? It'll be on a white wire on these cars that I'm used to. All right, so whenever you turn the uh, wiper off, that white wire still got power, but it's going through a set of points in the wiper, and that set of points opens when the wipers get down. So when the wipers go all the way down, they open those points and the power's not flowing anymore. When you turn on the wipers, it's bypassing that and the wipers are wiping. And if you happen to be measuring that, you're liable to see that making and breaking every time the wipers hit bottom. You see what I'm saying? Uh, I mean, sooner or later you're going to be dealing with that. Now on these Chevrolets, they got a silly little intermittent wiper board that's in the motor. It costs about $50 you can buy it at the parts house. And when the wipers quit working and do crazy things on them, che on them Chevys, you just put one of the little boards in that little motor that's easy as dirt to do. You know, it's a cool little way they got it fixed up. It doesn't cost a lot to fix them. We fix several of them here. You know, these Chevys, when the wipers don't work right and they got intermittent wipers on them, yeah. there's, a little, there's a little cover you take off the motor. There's a circuit board there. You take a screw out. You pull that board out. Unplug wires from it, which is going, you know, the wires that plug into the motor are going into this board. And that board actually connects to the wiper motor inside there. We change out. Uh, you don't change a bunch of them. Out. I felt proud of myself last week in Michigan because my great uncle he came up to me. He says, "Your dad told me you were going to college for automotive." I was like, "Yeah." He's like, "Well, you know anything about campers?" I was like, "Oh yeah, right." <laughs> I was like, "Not really." But yeah. what you got? He says, "Well, he's like he he explains the whole story of how he's trying to get it fixed. No one figured it out. And he says the motor that raises it up to get it level." Is, is going up, just won't go down. You try to go down, it just clicks. Mm -hmm. So I was like, all right. Dad, Dad come up, he's like, you sound like you got a bad gear. I was like, so it sounds like me. So and he's like, all right, go take it off. So I went over there, unplug it all, take it off. And I'm sitting there, just playing with it. He's turning, 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 turning. So he's like, all right. So take it apart, look inside the gears. The gear's fine. Nothing's wrong with the gears. So I'm like, all right, this is dumb. Why is it not going down? It's all catching everything. So finally, I sat there and I was like, huh. So I put pressure on it and tried to turn it like it would if it was raising it up or letting it down and just there. And, and they all clicked together. Yeah. Like, it, I mean, they didn't catch whenever. Yeah, yeah it, it was a mesh thing, a yeah, gear yeah, mesh thing. Yeah. Like, they'll, they'll catch when it's all loose, but when it's tight, they'll sit there and just. Click, 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 click. Yeah, yeah jump past one another. Yeah. yeah, he ended up spending $400 on a brand new motor. Well, your dad years. your dad diagnosed it the right way right to begin with. Yeah, he did. Yeah, so, but you actually went in there and verified that that was a problem. Mm -hmm. What really makes you feel, and you can figure that out if you're halfway smart. If the thing's working one way, but it's clicking the other way, you know power is getting to it. Yeah. So there's got to be something mechanical wrong with it. I mean, that's what your dad was thinking, you know, so. All right, number... Uh, the motor will actually work fine, we just needed... Yep, you needed the thing, gears. If you could get the gears, and you didn't have to have the motor, but they had to get the whole shooting match together. Yeah, if you had another one that had a you know bad motor and good gears, you could have made one out of two. Which of the following is not a system used for automotive power seats? 
A uh, five, a five, well, that'd be a five-way system, right? Oh, okay. One time there was this Ford Taurus that they bought. This guy bought it, and he didn't put power seats on it. I mean, he didn't get power seats on it, and then he decided he wanted them. And they come in, it's like a 99 or 2000 model Taurus, one of the last jobs I did at the dealership. He came in and he goes, the only power seats put on this car. Golly, you know what that's going to cost? You know, by the time we bought the seat tracks and all this kind of stuff, and figured in labor, it was like six or seven hundred dollars or something, or nine hundred, it was high. And I said, there ain't no way he's going to be willing to pay this. We said, it'd be like nine hundred bucks. He go, go ahead and do it. <laughs> when they say that, you always go, oh, you know. So. Some people like, like this Explorer come in, and the rear main seal was leaking. Rear main seal was leaking, power cover gasket, the transmission pan, it, it, it come up like almost fourteen hundred dollars. And Sam told her, he said, uh, I need half of it up front, you know. And she said, well, I'll be right back. I got it right now. Yeah. Never came back. No, but she came back. Oh, she came back and paid it out? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. You wouldn't expect that. It's like four. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, they'll, they'll pay it. You know, I mean, you'll be surprised what some people will pay when you think, well, they're never going to go here because the truck, the car even might look like a piece of junk to you. You know, you think, well, I would buy this car if, if it was $100 set beside it. Would buy it. And they're willing, people get attached to their cars and they'll think a car that you wouldn't even take home is the grandest thing they've ever owned. I mean, I've seen people like that before. I mean, just fall in love with the car they've been driving for so long because they know the car and all this, but anyway. I named my car. Yeah. Oh, 17. The horn of a vehicle yeah. equipped with a horn relay is blowing very weakly. Its sound level is continuous but low in volume. Technician A says the horn relay contacts may have excessive resistance. Technician B says the horn switch may be all fine. That's going to be A. going to be A if it's got some low voltage coming to it. All right. All right. Run through these, right? Technician A says the motor turns faster if there are more armature windings connected between the common and high speed brushes. Technician B says the less counter electromotive force in the armature, the greater the armature current. But That's B. It's actually only B. An inoperative electrochromatic mirror is being discussed. Technician A says the mirror's light sensor may be faulty. Technician B says the external mirror switch may be defective. That's A. All right. uh, technician A says the rotational direction of the power seat motor is determined by the current direction through it. Technician B says the power seat motor is bi-directional. 20 is C. Right. And 21. Technician A says a worn motor may be the problem when the passenger side power window will not go up or down. What is it usually nowadays, guys? Regular. Regulators usually come all to pieces. There's one out there right now. It's got a power window. Uh, regulator is bad. It's a 95 model. It's got one of them tape regulators in it. That's that tape that runs in that little thing. Yeah. Dumb thing that General Motors did for a while. Now, one time I was putting a power window motor in my brother's Cadillac. And uh, me and him were out there with my dad's shop working on it. And, of course, we were listening to the radio and all this kind of stuff. And um, when we got it, the, the window regulator replaced and all that kind of stuff, it was still real binding like it was real stiff and everything. And then we realized that we had just about run the battery down. <laughs> and we, I mean, the battery was weak. That's why the motor wasn't moving like it was supposed to. And I worried and worried with that. Uh, technician A says a worn motor may be the problem when the passenger's out. Let's see. Uh, map faulty master switch could be the problem. Let's see, both of them. Here, let me hit you with this. And this is the, the, the nature of power windows and power door locks if they're wired. A lot of people don't realize that those power windows are wired in series. You can have a right hand power window switch. In other words, you can run, let's say that you, you can move your, run your mirror, I mean your window down and up, your passenger window, you can run it down and up with your driver's side switch. But it will not work with a passenger side switch. So, and I've had this happen before. And the mechanic puts a passenger side switch on there and it still won't work. Could it be faulty wires or the driver side switch is bad. The driver side switch. Yeah. The one that works is the bad one. Well, that's dumb. <laughs> well, you got to know. Now, well, see, if you look, I got worksheets on there on power windows. I mean, what I'm saying is, this is going to teach you about the power windows. And every worksheet you don't do is going to cost you. You're not going to learn what that worksheet may teach you. Uh, if you've got your you got your power windows are designed in such a way to work. Okay. This yeah series. Huh? Okay. Yeah, they're in uh, series, but well, at rest, the switch on this side of the car is supposed to be getting a ground 
basically through this switch here. See, except on a, a 94 Thunderbird, and then it's backwards. The ground's over here. That's was stupid, but I mean, that, boy, that threw me for a loop when I was putting some power door. Oh, that's on the power door lock. But on the power window, if these these relays right here, I mean, these switches actually have are normally closed, providing the ground. And they're basically whatever that ground has got to go over here and feed this switch. See, so basically you're going to have to have six wires on each switch, right? Mm -hmm. And I can show you that in a schematic. But the fact is, uh, if there's no ground going to this switch over here, but there is a ground leaving this switch, then you got a wire problem. If there's no ground feeding this switch over here and no ground coming out of this switch to feed that switch, see this switch right here is depending on that switch for a ground. Yeah. Got it? And that's a, and power door locks a lot of times that way. Now a lot of your power door locks now are just contact switches. You know, because they'll have relays that do the do the work. And that's how that goes. All right. Alright, so anyway that uh, that's the way that works. So just always remember that just because the right hand power window doesn't work from that side, but the left hand it will work from the left hand, that doesn't mean the right, the right switch could be bad, but you better know how to troubleshoot that. Because if you don't, you're gonna be swapping a couple of switches. I'm gonna do that before. Yep. So you've seen this happen? Do you get smacked around? Okay. No, really. I, I look at the schematic and you look at the schematic and say, okay, I need to see if there's a ground coming to that switch over. Yep. You can figure that stuff out if you just think about it. And that's that's what my you know, this troubleshooting thing today is all about. Okay. The right front electric window is inoperative. The left one works okay. Technician A says the window motor may be a faulty ground. Technician B says either the left or right switch could be the cause. I just told you the answer to that one. Let's see. 23. That was 22. 23. Technician A says the grid and the electric rear, rear window defrogger is a series of controlled voltage amplifiers. Please. It's not nothing to that. Technician B says to protect the vehicle electrical system, the timer circuit may be incorporated. Now he's right. Just about all of those. Uh, that, that coffee tastes like somebody put a cigarette out of it. Okay, let's see. They didn't, but that's what it tastes like. All right. I can't. I can't complain because I'm the one that made it. Well, let me see. Um, that's the technician B. Technician A says if the blower motor resistor block gets too hot, the thermal limiter acts as a circuit breaker. Technician B, you know what the thermal limiter is? I don't know what it is. I've heard of it. Yeah, the thermal limiter. I need to get me a blower resistor to show this to you guys. If you pull the blower resistor on a lot of these cars, look at this, Matt. You're going to see a little bitty thing incorporated into that blower resistor, and it's going to look like this. Physically, it will look like this. This is not a schematic. This is what it'll look like. Got it? It's like a missile. It's a thermal fuse. It's a little bitty thing. This will be white. This will be a sort of a silver color. And that is a thermal fuse. Now, why do they have that there? Why is that thermal fuse there in the blower system? It's too hot, isn't it? That's right. But when you say thermal, that's what makes you think that. But at the same time, why is it necessary? Why do we even put that in there? It won't burn up the wire. It'll get too hot. Well, no, what happens is the airflow is keeping this resistor block cool. Remember that? Remember how over there I've got that little resistor block? This right here is a blower resistor. It didn't have one of those on it because it came out of a 91 Chevy and they weren't putting them on there again. That's a little archaic little resistor. And you can actually hook this up so that the fan's blowing all different speeds with this one here. We've done it before in here. Remember that? All right. Usually what they'll have is they'll have it so that any current that flows through here, through this resistor, when it's on anything except high, is going to be going through that thermal fuse. Okay, that thermal fuse, if the, let's say something happened to the blower motor and air got blocked where there's no air flowing through there, or maybe the, the uh, little swirl cage fan got stripped and the motor's still spinning and using current that's going through this resistor, but there's not any uh, airflow in there to keep that resistor cool. Or if leaves get trapped all over the resistor and it catches fire, yeah. hey, bro. And if this it catches fire, if it catches fire and there's flames here, then that thermal fuse is going to open that up. Now I don't know at the times I've seen it where the thermal fuse just got tired and it went away. And you know what? Well, this would be like fifty, sixty dollars. They wouldn't have one in stock. Customers traveling, I would drive from Bondi's down to the Radio Shack, and I would buy a uh, thermal fuse for a dollar and a half at the Radio Shack, and come up there and I'd bend it 
and I put little heat, you know, little uh, heat sinks, uh, alligator clips with dielectric grease on them to carry the heat out. And then I would solder that in there where the other one went, and you would still have a thermal thermal fuse, and everything would be fine. So you could tell when that thermal fuse is burned out if you just measure it. You know, it's all a good thing to do. But yeah. well, that was a bad self and everything. Same old thing. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. But anyway, that's what that that's the way I do. We're almost through with this test. All right. Number twenty-five. Which component within the wiper motor? Well, I'm sorry. Number twenty-four is C. Okay. Uh, technician B says. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah. Technician B says blower fan speed is controlled by a resistor block wired in series between the switch and the motor, and it is. Uh, but high speed always bypasses that resistor, so you're not going to have any kind of flow, current flow through that resistor in high speed. Uh, which component within the wiper motor ensures when the motor is turned off, the wiper arms will be brought to the bottom position? Park switch. The park switch. We talked about that just a few minutes ago. How many horn uh, circuits are generally? How, excuse me. How are horn circuits generally protected? E. It's going to be C. Either A or B. What's a fusible link? Anybody know what a fusible link is? No idea. A fusible link, I uh, used to have one in here or a picture one. A fusible link is a piece of wire that typically it has hypalon insulation on it, which hypalon insulation is extremely heat resistant. And it will it'll be a thicker piece of wire. Thicker? I mean the, well it'll look thicker than a regular piece of wire, but it'll actually be the gauge of the wire will be smaller than the rest of the wire in the circuit. And they want that piece of wire to burn in two. Got it? And so a lot of the time you won't see where it burned in two, you'll just be able to stretch it. When you can stretch it, you know it's burned in two. That's on an older bottle of cars. All right, that's got you all done. All right, you got that? Yep. All right, let me stop that camera.